every part of the animal has a different profile of nutrient. Mm -hmm. And so it's good to have the variety, just like we talk about having a variety of vegetables being important, yeah, yeah. A variety of nuts being important, a variety of parts of an animal also. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm in Napa, California with Kate Shanahan, who's a MD, a physician, and the author, co-author with her husband Luke, of Deep Nutrition, Why Your Genes Need Traditional Food, Deep Nutrition, and a, re a more recent book, Food Rules. I love the pun in that, Kate. That is so good. Kate. A Doctor's Guide to Healthy Living, which we'll talk about both of them. Kate, thanks for joining me in this. I, thanks for coming. I feel <laughs> like I feel like um, the start. A lot of our shows are about people's resilience, whether it's to an emergency or or a lack of resources. But one, I think the foundation for any of our per res resilience is our personal health. Absolutely, you, know, you can't do a whole lot else unless you're feeling healthy. And part of what attracted me in reading, I loved reading Do Nutrition, is I felt like you were. You work, are working on some basic principles. Because, I mean, there's paleo, there's vegan, there's vegetarianism, and I feel like you sort of distilled that. Yeah, we tried to make it simple. <laughs> and we tried to have our underlying philosophy become clear and come through and help people decide what if our underlying philosophy resonates with theirs. And our underlying philosophy is that nature knows best, right? Hmm. So if we've done... Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nature yeah. was doing pretty well for a, a bit of a while. Yes. Uh, yes. Before we showed up. And, uh, and what we were doing before we started writing books about health was just what came naturally. So we did pretty well for... We you humans. Know, we as humans, a all species. Right, all right. Um, yeah, we're, we're doing pretty well. So um, we are just trying, Luke and I, we're just trying to go back to um, understanding what people used to do. You know, so based on that simple idea that whatever it was that got us here is definitely better than what we're doing now. In order to be healthy, you know, you do need to not overeat. You, there's certain protein and macro, other macronutrient ratios you need to pay attention to. But if you take all that complexity away and just make it real simple, yeah. the simple thought is let's just do what people used to do. So, well, gosh darn, what the heck was that? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so very, um, like, bland, you know, the very base of it is people used to live off of the, the land that they lived on, mm -hmm. self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And um, they would, we, what we, what Luke and I did to try and answer the question of what people used to do, we did a whole bunch of stuff, but one of the main things and one of the funnest things was to just look at what people eat now where their culinary traditions are relatively intact and not completely disrupted in the way that they are in America by things like you know the fast food chains and all the convenience foods that we have. Mm -hmm. So where people are simply just still cooking more for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This happened a lot in Hawaii until very, very recently because uh, when we, I should mention when we wrote the books, we were living in Hawaii. Ah, okay. Um, and uh, we had been invited to potlucks where people had like these displays of a very traditional food mm -hmm. that they were very proud of. And, um, you know, they would basically take us, you know how like sometimes you go on a tour of people's houses and they'll, they're very proud of how they remodeled it. Well, they were very proud of how they modeled their, their buffet table. So they would take us on a little tour around and this mm -hmm. is things I don't even remember how to pronounce, uh, but they were very colorful. They were made out of every part of a goat, a chicken, a fish, a uh, pig. And well, so they have there. I think that covers it. Yeah. Animal wise. All right. And of course, lots of vegetables that were not exactly familiar to us either because they're more of an Asian flair. So everything mm -hmm. was really long and skinny, like the beans were this long. <laughs> the yes, yes, the yes. Asian cucumbers, which I don't really still don't understand how to eat, but they're very, very, very skinny. <laughs> so all kinds of crazy stuff. And you know, we realized that there's a lot more uh, tradition outside of America. So yes. in order to get a sense of what people outside of America um, did we didn't do anything as 
as, um, I guess, fun as what you guys are doing. Get on a uh, plane and travel to other countries. We mostly watch travel and eating shows oh. and read cookbooks from all over the world and old cookbooks from America. And we came up with four things that people did to live off the land, no matter where they were. Okay. Um, they would have fresh food. That's kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> okay, fresh, fresh, whether cooked or not? Yeah, uh, including cooked and raw. Okay, all right. Um, so seasonal, there's an element of seasonality. Sure, sure. Um, and then they would have fermented and sprouted. They had to invent fermented because if there was too much in a given season of something, they had to store it. It wasn't always canning. <laughs> so things would naturally ferment. They didn't know anything about you know bacteria and all this, but they just knew that if you put, uh, for example, um, you know, cabbage, uh, actually a Hawaiian example, is um, a certain kind of fish that's, that you can only do this with when it's no bigger than this. It's only present, like I think in like November and December, and um, what you do is you take out the guts and you put them in a uh, plastic container, not exactly traditional, under the sink, not exactly traditional, but I'm sure it derives from something very traditional, and let it sit for six months and it becomes a, the like secret magic ingredient in Filipino cooking, which is a mm. special kind of fish sauce. So okay. fermentation, so it, it enabled, the right conditions enable our food to be edible six months later um, instead of canning or freezing it actually adds nutrition. So it's a really, really big important It adds category. nutrition. I think that's one of the big things that's, I mean, fermentation is starting to get, you know, more buzz. And it's like, that's a piece that most of us may not have realized. It's like, it's not just about storage. Right, yes, it it's, adds it's nutrition. nutrition. It adds like a whole ecosystem because you're getting all these, um, not animals, bacteria, yeah. uh, microorganisms, yeast, um, bac good bacteria. So it's a whole, a whole world of, mm. um, of, uh, of our bodies that we're really just beginning to tap into scratch the surface of what's in there and everything. So fermented where foods, it came from. not just vegetables, but, but you just gave me a fish example as well, mm -hmm. and, and sprouted. And so we've heard, you know, bean sprouts, you know, but what else can get sprouted? Any kind of seed, uh, oh. and that means that includes nuts, that includes mm -hmm. grains, that mm -hmm. includes um, uh, like your, what you think of as a seed, because we call them seeds, like sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds. So you can just gently um, let them sit in water and somewhat partially germinate them. Why would you want to be sprouting seeds instead of just eating your nuts or, or eating the seeds directly? Because a lot of people do that. Yeah, well, um, I think the main benefit for, uh, for like traditionally, keeping it like with the perspective of why would anybody do that in the past, um, has to do with the fact that if you're trying to get nutrition from something really small and hard and starchy, like grain, um, you know, um, wheat, barley, um, that it um, is impossible to do without uh, either crushing it, you know, mm. with a stone, which is a heavy labor, not easy to do, those things are going to bounce around. Um, and, uh, or you could just let nature take its course a little bit and soften it up and then you can use it that way and smush it into a paste much more easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, there's health benefits when you do that, when you let nature take its course. Nature is best. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So what happens is uh, with the uh, grain, the reason I recommend eating sprouted grain bread is uh, that when you take a wheat berry, uh, which is what they make flour from, um, but you don't have the flour, you just have the wheat berries, and you sprout them for a day or two, just enough to have a little bitty root. A lot of that um, starch in there that is, you know, going to be converted into sugar in the blood, in the digestive system, so that by the time it's in the bloodstream, it's just sugar. Mm -hmm. It gets converted by the enzymes in the seed to um, whatever it was the plant was going to need. So all kinds of vitamins ah. and um, even amino acids a little bit, and um, certainly more fiber. So it's a healthier thing. Uh -huh. And you can do this with any kind of bean, garbanzo beans, mung beans, mm -hmm. chickpeas. Mm -hmm. You can do it just a day or two or three or whatever, just to get a little bitty root. And um, you know, another benefit is beyond just the, the fact that like, so now you can maybe make a dough out of it, but who's really gonna do that? If you wanna um, make a soup, but you don't wanna buy the canned beans, right. you can get them in their dry, dehydrated form. But if you sprout them first, uh, it it does a little bit, it takes a little bit off of the cooking time. Because uh -huh. normally sure. you'd have to cook sure. it forever and ever. And a lot of the seeds have, have coatings that basically 
don't want to get uh, stuff that doesn't want to get digested, right? Phytic acid or something yeah. like that, right? Uh, so right. you're also getting rid, you're dispersing some of that so that well, it's exactly. More digestible. So those things that we call anti nutrients that a lot of people are mm -hmm. sensitive to um, are uh, are in the seed for a reason. Again, what does nature want? What That's is the right. purpose here? We're doing what nature wants. <laughs> right. All right. So the reason is so that it, it's not going to get leached into the soil or just like be lost before the plant is ready to germinate and make use of it. So that when you start the germination process, now these enzyme, enzymes um, that are also converting the starch into more nutrition are breaking down some of these anti-nutrients so that the plant can use them better itself. Okay, okay. So, so it's a win-win for everyone. We get the best of what... <laughs> The plant, the seed wanted to do to grow the plant. Yes, we're getting the, the that benefit. Yeah, too. okay, exactly. Okay, so you gave us fresh, right? And you gave us fermented and sprouted. Mm -hmm. What's There's three? Two more exciting right. pillars. Yeah. <laughs> so um, number three is meat on the bone, and um, so we call it meat on the bone because we really want to emphasize that we want to think of using the whole animal down to every last bit, including the bones. And um, so it's a simple concept. Basically, uh, if you get boneless, skinless, like chicken breast, that is not meat on the bone. If you get a whole chicken and roast it and, and enjoy all the nice juices, mm -hmm. that, that kind of a whole um, piece uh, will produce yummy gravy and stuff. And then you save the bones once you're done with the meal. You can actually boil them with some veggies and now you have a whole other like base for another dish, like a yes. soup or yes. you know, to use yes. the stock. So meat on the bone. And um, so that would say, I mean, is, is, when you're saying everything, you're eating the fats, mm -hmm. you're eating everything that's skin, is the skin, the yeah. ligaments, everything that's edible that you can chew. Everything, everything that can go down in a and, pot. And you're also <laughs> then talking about making bone broth of a sort. Right, from yes. the remaining bones. Uh-huh, yeah. And why would you want to do that if you, mm -hmm. <clears throat> if it was like, you know... Uh, that's a little extra work here. Yeah. That's what's in bone exactly. broth. Exactly, it's special. a lot of work. So, um, what you do is you, you get two things, two basic large categories of, of macronutrients. One is hydrolyzed collagen, and another one is uh, glycosaminoglycans which are... Uh, a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> they are, they are <laughs> in a lot of ways. What do they do? Maybe you start the right question. Those two uh, compounds are, they act like growth factors for the cells in your body that help promote, or promote the growth of more collagen. That's what they do. Fibroblasts, mm. they, uh, they create collagen. So they actually, these compounds act as growth factors. So it's, it's almost like a youth serum. It's almost like a hormone without ah. the hormone side effects. So, is that is that for is that for even even adults? I mean, we're talking about the growth factor for. I mean, is it particularly helpful? It's for your cells. So as long as you have oh. these kinds of cells, it's you're good. All right. Okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so at any age, and I, I've had people around the world write to me and tell me that they've experienced lots of benefits. So people have uh, uh, complimented them on their their hair, their skin, their nails, and one uh, woman wrote and said uh, very happily that uh, her neighbor asked her if she had done Botox. And she said, no, <laughs> bone broth, not Botox. So, Fabulous, yeah. that's a great line. Yeah. So it's euthening, it you know, by Absolutely. just adding some, because you know, I think of collagen as a, as a kind of a glue. It's not a glue, exactly, but it's, you know, for the joints, for the, you know, it keeps us flexible. It's what helps, holds all of our cells together. If it weren't for collagen, we would just be piles of individual um, cells, you know, kind of like pond scum. Sorry. <laughs> no, we don't eat pond scum. Okay, meat on the bone. And, and so if someone is, is, say, wanting to be vegetarian it, or vegan, mm -hmm. is there any way to, to get the equivalent to the meat on not the bone? Not exactly the equivalent, but not too far off are some of the compounds in seaweed. Um, oh. And um, uh, yeah, speaking of pond scum, uh, <laughs> no, actually, seaweed's really delicious. I, I like it. Um, so a lot of the, the kind of like sea vegetables, because before a long, long time ago, going back billions of years, we all were just individual cells. What was it that created the multicellular organism? It was these kinds of biomolecules that hold other cells together. So okay. glycosaminoglycans. Um, 
actually very similar molecules are present in um, the seaweeds because they use that same technology that you know eventually became uh, multicellular organisms and then jellyfish before okay. there was us okay. we were very right. similar to the jellyfish um, and our cells were held together with the same kind of goo and so um, plants went one way we went another way we go more to the collagens plant went more to I think they're glycoproteins rather than proteoglycans or maybe I got that backwards but anyway on a molecular basis they're relatively similar mm -hmm. so there's reason to believe that they would have some overlap in their benefits but I don't think it would be nearly the same but still it's gonna be better than not doing it at all okay, okay. so things like carrageenan and um, anything seaweed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, I mean, it's, it's good to know. I mean, how do you keep, keep the flexibility if somebody wants not to have meat on the bone? I would imagine you do fish on the bone as well. You, exactly. You yeah. This, this yes. Totally. Yeah. Really good point. Um, because yeah, a lot of vegetarians do are okay, perfectly okay with fish, fish and right. all the same benefits from fish as chicken, as beef, as pork. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people ask me what animal can you use? And the answer is, it's not the animal, it's the bones. And again, this gets back to where's, ah. what, what are we really getting at? And that the ancient technology that connects all of us, you know, goes back billions of years. So it's the same glycosaminoglycans, the same um, collagen, the same everything, no matter the animal. They look different to us, but to ourselves, it's the same okay. recognizable stuff. Good, thank you. We got meat on the bone and seaweed on the bone. Or <laughs> <laughs> and number four, what's four? So I saved the, the best for last, organ meats. Organ Yum. meats, which 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 is feels so foreign in this culture, other than maybe liver. Right, right, right. yeah. Everyone. So I'll talk a lot about organ liver in their experience, but organ meats are good for us because they are really repositories of some very special nutrients. You know, we when we think of eating, um, you know, cow or chicken or whatever. We typically think of just the muscle meat, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, so we already mm -hmm. talked about bone, but there's this whole other category of stuff in there. And, you know, there's this whole movement now of nose to tail eating, which has, mm -hmm. it's a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, wanting to honor the animal. So it comes from the chefs. It comes from, mm -hmm. a, a, seems to me, comes from the sustainable farming. Um, yes. and it, it comes from tradition and it's all the same thing. You know, it's just the way people used to think. If we go through the trouble of catching an animal or raising it, we're going to eat the whole thing. So, um, organs like heart have, um, nutrients, uh, heart particularly is high in omega-3 fatty acids, mm -hmm. um, compared to, uh, muscle meat. Um, liver has a lot of B vitamins, really great for supporting the health of your bone marrow, which is the foundation for your immune system. Um, and kidneys have um, also a lot of omega-3, and they actually have some vitamin D, mm -hmm. a certain type of vitamin D. The adrenal glands, if you can manage to find those with hanging around your kidney, they are located right on top of the kidney. So depending on what your butcher gives you. The adrenal glands have a whole ton of um, vitamin C, and also hormones, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so every part of the animal has a different profile of nutrient, mm -hmm. and so it's good to have the variety, just like we talk about having a variety of vegetables being important, yeah, yeah. variety of nuts being important, a variety of parts of an animal also. I would imagine that goes back to what nature does best, is like animals eat, or, or these animals eat, a wide variety of things, right? Yeah. Because you're going to get right. some little little odd thing that you don't normally get, and if you get this odd plant, whatever it is. Yeah, like when left variety. to their own devices, absolutely. So, you know, pasture-raised um, animals are a little bit closer to that, that wild, mm -hmm. actual, um, mm -hmm. what, what the animal used to really eat. So in our book, we really emphasize source. Ah, do talk about that because what I realized is everything, there's an assumption that in everything we've talked about here is real food um, and not, I didn't hear anything packaged in here or processed in here. <laughs> we should talk about those as well, but talk, talk about source. So, you know, just knowing your farmer, just the mm -hmm. simple thing of, you know, if, if you're buying stuff from, you know, Ink Industries, they have, there's no, no uh, accountability. Right, if the, 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 the stuff doesn't have to be non-toxic, right, right, right? right, it can right. be contaminated with bacteria, because what's it to them, you know, unless they 
get sued or whatever. So just the, the, one, the one level of the accountability, um, so you're buying something from somebody you actually looked at in mm -hmm. the eye. Mm -hmm. um, the other is that, you know, the people who are not part of a huge industry are, are almost always um, going to care a whole lot more about the, the animals yes. themselves. Yes. So they have a better yes. life and it's just fairer <laughs> yes. on yes. that level. Um, and of course, part of that is making sure that the farmers fortify the soil and diversify the animal's diet. Mm -hmm. And so all this, of course, naturally has um, benefits to our health, right? And, and just for what you said. Mm -hmm. The, um, the variety, and then also something else called bioconcentration, which is um, the ability of a nutrient or a toxin these days. We talk more about it in that term. Um, the bioconcentration, for example, of PCPs up the food chain. So Pesticides, that, yeah, kinds of stuff, right? Mm -hmm, right? Right, and arsenic and lead and all this stuff we don't want. That does bioconcentrate. So, you know, animal products, because they are not at the bottom of the food chain, have pound for pound more of that kind of bad stuff. Okay. But they also have pound for pound, they're supposed to, it's how it's supposed to work, they have more of the good stuff too. And yeah. so okay. the, the better that the um, animal's life was and the better that they, you know, ate a healthy diet and were well cared for, they're, they're, they're out there working for us in the fields, mm -hmm. bioconcentrating that part of the earth um, so it can become something that we can benefit from. So the best of the world are the farmers, the smaller operations, who recognize that part of what they're doing is building soil right. along with creating healthy animals who are free to roam and have fairly happy lives. And we get to eat some and bless those happy lives. I, mean, I, <laughs> I don't think that's a, invisible. You know that, that an animal wasn't stressed, right? Wasn't full of medicines and steroids and other unnatural toxic stuff. I don't think it's talked about enough because I can't tell you how many patients I've had and people I've talked to who are vegetarian, and I ask them, "So are you doing it for health reasons or ethical reasons?" Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, "Well, I watched this movie about how our meat is made, and I said no more meat for me." Mm -hmm. And that, it's true. It's our food chain is disgusting. And so, so it seems like there should be, you know, an alternative for those people who actually care about how yes. their animals, there yes. should be more of it. Of course there is an alternative, but it's just expensive. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons that I enjoy doing these kinds of interviews is because your audience is partly people who appreciate that stuff, but yes. also my favorite part of your audience is the people who actually do it. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, right. And, and you, you know, and we've interviewed the farmers and the growers and stuff who really do care for the animals and care for the soil and so on. And they know they're doing the right thing by, by everyone, mm -hmm. right? So I think the alternative to the, the horrible, I mean, the factory farms should be banned yesterday. I mean, this is horrible. Um, but for people to know that that small local farm, you're helping a local person. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, that, but it's not all like that, you know, because people do know so little about how the food is produced these yeah. days because we're so distant from it. So that, you know, for an impressionable 8-year-old or 16-year-old or whatever, because it's usually what people tell me that they were, you know, young when they saw yes. these things yes. that changed the way they want to eat for the rest of their lives, um, that they, they don't know that there's any alternative. All they see is this horror, and they're like, okay, mm -hmm. so no I'm, more chicken for right, me, mom, right. it's out. And mom doesn't know enough to say to have a discussion about what really <laughs> what really is motivating the child to say that. In this whistle stop last two minutes of ish that we have, I noted that you've got only two items on your sort of avoid the toxics. Right. Avoid. You've got just two. What are those? So we know what not to eat. So the two things that nobody should eat no matter what your um, allergy list profile is or isn't are um, vegetable oils and I can go over those um, and excessive amounts of carbohydrate. Carbohydrate is sugars and starches. Yes, so sugar, starches, whether they're natural or not, ah. one, by the time it's digested and in our bloodstream, it is in a, the body has no way of knowing whether it came from a Twinkie, a glucose molecule, or from you know a blueberry. So it's the total amount of uh, glucose and sucrose and sugar. It's the dose that makes the poison when it comes to sugar. So, so that would include things like potatoes mm -hmm. and grains. I mean, you're talking right. about not having a lot of starch. Yeah, just being aware of how much you're getting because uh, with our food chain being what it is these days, it's much more heavy on what we produce. So it's in the grocery stores, it's in the processed Everywhere. foods. Yeah. Everywhere. So you have to be aware of how much you're getting and try to be smart about your carbs. 
Um, so, because you will get some in vegetables and sure, root vegetables sure. and things that are otherwise healthy, even nuts and dairy and stuff like that. But um, you just need to know how it all adds up. And then, so vegetable oils are um, are processed, industrially refined. Another, the industry, culinary industry term for them is RBD oil. It stands for refined bleached deodorized. Woo! I, I, you, you took us through, in the book, you took us through all of the steps. I mean, it sounded like the world's, you know, Dr. Frankenstein's <laughs> chemistry experiment of all the, the poisonous stuff used to make vegetable oils. So vegetable oils, by that you mean... I mean, olive oil is okay because it's fruit, right? But, but you're talking about canola and sunflower and safflower and... There's know. six common ones. Corn, canola, cottonseed, soy, sunflower, safflower. I do you got three C's and three S's. Um, and then, but really there's so many other oils popping up these days um, that the bottom line is how was it produced. Okay. And so you can know that by looking at the bottle if the bottle's really tiny and really expensive. Um, or if you get to taste it and it has any kind of recognizable flavor, it's good. So, because oh. some oils are, are play both sides, like grapeseed oil. There's there's boutique grapeseed oils which are really good for you, and then there's batch processed, you know, uh, not great uh, grapeseed oil. So if you can taste the oil, that's really interesting because olive oil has a flavor to mm -hmm. it. Um, coconut oil has a you know has a flavor to it. It's wonderful. I love coconut oil. Yes. Um, okay. So what you're saying is avoid the industrial, I mean, when you're saying with the starches as well, you're talking about no flour, or at least basically, very well, little flour. Yeah, exactly. No, no, how much you're, yeah, it should be a treat. Aha. Uh -huh. Kind of like fruit. Treat, treat it like a, 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 a something that you rarely have and it's, a, it's, it's fabulous. You get your tablespoon of flour or whatever it is. Yeah. We have pizza, you know, we'll have pizza, but it's only a couple times a year. Yeah. It's homemade. Yeah. Luke makes yeah. it. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Kate, thank you. You're this welcome. It's been wonderful. This has been a whistle stop tour, but I think that you've given <laughs> given us some good principles to work with for right. for optimal health. And I do want to say that just in this last moment, that the food rules looks to me like I haven't read it yet. A wonderful, playful book with short, easy to to you know involve children. Don't snap. Uh, yeah. No, you you know that that I think that people. Um, well, it makes this accessible. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I actually, I designed it for the bathroom reader. Aha! Yes. So, <laughs> I hope to see that one in the bathrooms across America. There we go. <laughs> you want to see food rules in the bathroom so that you know that what comes out came from something really good going in. I'm with Kate Shanahan. Join us next time at Peak Moment. Like, it will be complete. <laughs>